Welcome to this presentation on pectin, which is one of the crucial prebiotics I've reviewed in detail for you. We all know the saying, an apple a day keeps a doctor away. Well, I'm going to show you that there is proof to that statement. Pectin is a wonderful prebiotic, which feeds several of the most beneficial bacteria within your microbiome, including the superstar of the gut, Fecalibacterium prasleyi. First, pectin is a complex compound with many various fuel sources attached via various bonds. This is a good thing. We don't want a prebiotic product which has been already snipped into smaller pieces for the sake of marketing a product. We want a prebiotic which takes time to ferment, which is able to reach the colon and whose features feed the many key health promoters. Second, no one bacteria possesses all the enzymes to degrade pectin. Pectin varies quite a bit from source to source, and with its complex structure, it is a bit of a team effort to ferment it. And third, as seen in the blue rectangle, disease-associated taxa such as Klebsiella pneumoniae, highlighted here, possess enzymes able to degrade pectin, arabinoxylin, and other prebiotics. Some other bad acting species listed here come from a number of other problematic genera such as Escherichia, Enterococcus, Flavonifractor, and Fusobacteria. On average, the prebiotics, which I routinely recommend, are the preferred fuels for the health promoters, which is why I use them. But given the enzymatic activity across all players, an intelligent approach is needed to drive the microbiome in a favorable direction. In the presentation, we'll be looking at several studies using a humanized in vitro model to analyze the effects of pectin on the microbiome. But first, what is a humanized in vitro model? Well, it's a man-made system like this one shown here. It's designed to supposedly replicate all or parts of the gastrointestinal tract and is inoculated with the feces from one or more volunteers. I know, gross. Luckily, I've never done this and will never do it. And although these models, methodologies, and results vary quite a bit, they do yield some usable information. For example, pH can be controlled, which proves to be a crucial factor and something we can't control for in an in vivo, inside a living person experiment. Also, the absorption of short-chain fatty acids in humans varies substantially, making fecal short-chain fatty acid results questionable. However, they can be more accurately measured in these systems. In the end, it's not a living GI tract, but with enough experience, which I provide for you, you can use the appropriate clues while sifting out the background noise. Now, when we start an experiment in studies, or you begin your personal regimen at home, we all have our own unique microbiome at the starting blocks. The exact species present and their abundance, the amount of real estate they occupy, is never the same. With that said, we do share the same themes. For example, your microbiome and mine both have butyrate producers, but they are not exactly the same. Anything we ingest affects our microbiome, and this is especially true when someone begins a robust prebiotic regimen. The big blue arrow highlights the genus level data for the three donors in this pectin study. As you can see from the dissimilarity in colors, each microbiome is different from the others solely as represented by the top 20 genera. Therefore, the immediate changes in a given microbiome are largely based upon the starting microbiome. However, a proper regimen will drive significant environmental shift quite quickly and the changing microbiomes would become more similar, representing a community based upon widely available substrates. This paper illustrates two important points, that of the starting microbiome we just covered and that of complexity of your prebiotic. These researchers used three types of pectin prebiotics in healthy elderly versus younger healthy subjects in a humanized in vitro experiment. The prebiotics used were regular pectin, a partially hydrolyzed pectin, it's been chopped up a little bit, and a pectin oligosaccharide product, it's been chopped up a lot. The more chopped up, the smaller in molecular size, therefore complexity. Figure A shows that the superior of the gut, Fecalibacterium prausitiae, responded significantly better to pectin and partially hydrolyzed pectin in comparison to pectin oligosaccharides due to the fact that the enzymatic machinery of F. prausitiae is geared towards more complex molecules and less towards the simple oligosaccharides. This principle also applies to other prebiotics in the marketplace, such as FOS, 
fructooligosaccharides and GOS, galactooligosaccharides. I prefer using the more complex prebiotics, and this is especially true for those with SIBO who do not want simple prebiotics fermenting in their upper small intestine. To continue on the theme of prebiotic complexity, I have another humanized in vitro study which used various manipulated forms of peptin to measure microbial response. This is a complex slide, but the idea here is that different bacteria based upon their enzymatic machinery are able to feed off of different components of pectin to varying degrees. The red represents a positive response, while the blue a negative. Whether the factor being considered is an individual sugar, the pectin backbone, degree of branching, or degree of esterification, the point is in that in order to feed the full consortium of health promoting bacteria in your microbiome, more specifically, your colonic microbiome, we want to ingest complex prebiotics, not simplified ones because a company says their product has been shown to increase bifidobacteria. There are a slew of amazing health promoting bacteria we need to feed, and not just with pectin. Pectin is but one of a number of prebiotics I use. Other health promoting bacteria which prefer other fuels, such as resistant starch, arabinose islands, and others, need to be taken into consideration as well for a given microbial fingerprint. I use these multiple prebiotics, as I stated, based upon the microbial fingerprint of the individual. That's one of two key components to my regimens. The other is dose, which is essentially to drive change rapidly, at the center of which is pH. With that said, and yet another humanized in vitro study, we illustrate a very important point, which is crucial to understanding how to modulate the microbiome, that of pH. Generally speaking, Health-promoting bacteria, particularly the butyrate producers within eubacteriales, require a more acidic pH to outcompete other bacteria, including those bacteria more neutral in action, as well as those who are opposition pathogens. Here, the response of various bacteria to pectin was measured at various pH levels. As shown in Figure 2, two key health-promoting species, Carpococcus comes and Fecalibacterium prosiciae, fell off a cliff as pH increased. The point being that small doses of any prebiotic, pectin or otherwise, should not be administered into a dysbiotic gut. I guarantee you that the pH of the dysbiotic gut is almost always higher than it should be, and considering that many pro-inflammatory bacteria can also use prebiotics as fuel, you'll only be spinning your wheels. Only with properly dosed and blended prebiotics can you rapidly drive significant environmental shift in the lumen of the colon to provide a health-promoting microbiome. And pectin is a key part of my regimens of properly blended and dosed prebiotics because it has been repeatedly shown to increase the abundance of key health-promoting taxa. In this slide, we have a couple of points worth mentioning. Again, this is another humanized in vitro study examining which bacteria grow on which substrates. In table three to the right, we can see a breakdown of the findings in regards to pectin. The thick blue arrow shows us that a number of strains from various bacteroidae species degrade pectin, something which has been proven over and over again. The middle blue arrow shows that three out of five Eubacterium elegans strains were able to utilize pectin. E. elegans is another amazing health-promoting bacterium which has been reclassified into the genus Lepnospire. On the bottom, eight of 10 F. prausicii strains tested were able to utilize pectin. Therefore, our points highlight that pectin is a fuel for two amazing health promoters, but not for all of the strains within each species. In addition, these researchers also reinforce the all-important theme of pH, which we just covered. They showed that Bacteroides was less able to ferment pectin at the lowest pH, while F. prausicii grew well. In yet another in vitro study, a wider variety of more complex fuels were analyzed for microbial response. Components of foods you'd ideally include in your varied and healthy diet. This research investigated the effect of different types of plant cell wall fibers, including cereals, legumes, and tuber cell wall fibers on the fecal fermentation profiles and gut microbiota composition. On the bottom left, the nine light micrographs of the fibers all look the same to you and I. But to your microbiome, it's the difference between a delicious meal or chewing on cardboard for us. The tubers perform much better than the other plant cell wall fibers in regards to increasing many of the superstars of the gut, including ruminococcus, carpococcus, 
Lachnospira, Fecalibacterium, Roseburia, and Gemager, as seen in dark green at the bottom of the figure D. This is theorized in large part to the higher pectin content of the cell walls of the tubers in comparison with the other fibers. But in reality, the pectin content wasn't much different from the legumes. However, the content of monosaccharides was however different. This highlights variability in pectin structure across different foods and paints tubers, at least in this study, in a very favorable light. Even when improperly administered, pectin can have some benefit. Something I've been advocating for years now is the use of properly dosed and blended prebiotics following FMT, fecal microbiota transplant. Whatever your health, your colonic microbiome is dependent on the food residue that makes its way past the small intestine. In the example of FMT, you can try to replace an unhealthy ulcerative colitis microbiome with a healthy one, but in order to maximize this transfer over the long term, you need to feed the health promoters in your new microbiome the fuels they prefer. In this in vivo study, finally a study in people for you, two groups of UC ulcerative colitis subjects underwent FMT, with one group receiving 20 grams per day of pectin for five days, the FMT group in Table 3. Although five days is far too short in my opinion, and although there were no macro differences in gut flora between the pectin and non-pectin groups over the study period, the pectin group had drastically lower levels of shigatoxin-producing E. coli than the non-pectin group, as shown by the blue arrow, which is a good thing as it's a more nefarious version of E. coli. A more intelligent use of properly blended and dosed prebiotics over an extended period of time would be more appropriate and beneficial for the FMT recipients. Pectin supplements can come from a variety of sources, and pectin itself is found in a number of foods as you've now learned. But as we saw in the previous slide, and we'll see here, when improperly administered in the real world in humans, not in vitro, we run the risk of little to no result. The most commonly used sources and studies are from apple, citrus, and as shown here, beet. In this study of four weeks in duration, 15 grams per day of sugar beet pectin did not alter the microbiome in neither the young or elderly subjects. I always use more than 15 grams per day in total prebiotics, but nevertheless, 15 grams per day of a single prebiotic is not insubstantial. Given this study, and being familiar with all pectin studies across the board, as well as knowing the differences in pectin structure between sources, I'm partial to using apple pectin exclusively. For example, studies show that around 90% of apple pectin reaches the terminal ileum, the end of the small intestine, while less 60 to 88 percent of citrus pectin does so. So which apples are best? There are differences in pectin content between apples and also between stages of maturity. This paper highlights the differences between three, Renata Canada, Golden Delicious, and Pink Lady. As you can see in Table 1, the Renata Canada had more soluble fiber than the other two, and this perhaps is what contributed to its superior results in regards to increasing Fecalibacterium prausicii. I recommend Granny Smith apples, organic if possible. Each year, the Environmental Working Group, EWG, analyzes the most recent USDA data to compile its infamous Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen lists. These list the types of fruits and vegetables that tend to be grown with the least and most pesticides, respectively. I can't remember a year when apples were not on the Dirty Dozen list. I know the prices of everything are ridiculous now. But when it comes to apples, it's probably worth some extra money to buy organic. I often recommend pectin in my protocols. Why is that? Because it is only one of two prebiotics which have been reliably shown to significantly increase Fecalibacterium prausicii levels in multiple human and humanized in vitro studies. As you're learning from my presentations, F. prausicii is a clear superstar in the microbiome, and increasing its presence, if low, is of paramount importance. Pectin also regularly increases other known amazing health promoters within the genus Lacnospira. I have searched for years for pectin in supplement form, but I'm unhappy with everything I've seen. If it's a product with capsules, then the dose will be too low or the pill burden will be too high. Many products list apple fiber, but don't claim the amount of pectin. All pectin products I've seen are diluted, but often don't state to what degree, or if they do, it's too high. 
Therefore, my recommendation is simply two Granny Smith apples per day, organic if possible. You can also add other root vegetables to your diet such as carrots, which are a good source of pectin in terms of quantity and quality, as it contains a high percentage of the highly branched RG1 unit. If you found this presentation informative, I have many more for free in my YouTube channel and also in the Microbiome University tab on my website, themicrobiomexpert.com. There you can select from a wide variety of topics. And if you or a loved one are struggling with a disease slash condition, I have condition-specific presentations as well, along with their microbiome protocols found within its respective tab on my website.